Today, September 19, 2012, uh, Professor Emeritus Norm Furtick. One of USC's Emeriti Center's goals is to capture the history of the University of Southern California through the experience of the movers, shakers, and the molders who have played prominent roles in our history. The USC Living History Project features retired faculty and staff of the University of Southern California. In this interview, we have a chance to reach back over several decades a most uniquely qualified USC faculty, Professor Norman Fertig. Norm is Professor Emeritus of the School of International Relations at the University of Southern California and was also Director of Letters, Arts, and Sciences Honors Program, Dean for Honors and Advisement, and also the National President for the Association of NROTC Colleges and Universities. So Norm, what was your background, training, ex and experience before coming to USC? Well, after graduating from uh, Roosevelt High School in East Los Angeles, I delayed for one semester to save a little money to start. And I lived in Whittier as a little boy and decided I wanted to try Whittier College for a while. Actually, I had two choices, going to see where I had a job promised to me and very attractive and thought that'd be the best thing to do in 1935 when jobs were pretty hard to find. But my mother was a little bit worried about me getting way too far from home and I talked about what her college, so mainly to please her, I thought, well, I'll give it a year in college. So I enrolled at Whittier College, uh, the school that I'd seen as a little boy and always uh, had some curiosity about. I uh, had a small student body at the time of around 450 students, but it was a place where I could feel comfortable, played football, played baseball, studied once in a while, enjoyed it immensely, finally found my wife there. But it was a slow process of gradual development. Uh, mainly, I think, uh, up to that point, I'd been basically self-educated, and that was probably because I had uh, a great compulsion to read. I had things happen to me very early on that uh, were somewhat traumatic because of a family break, a period of some hardship, but uh, putting that aside, I became immensely attracted to the public library. And when they uh, checked out three books for me at third grade, after I'd returned them in two weeks, I had to wait two weeks, I thought, because they said these are after two weeks. It was a deadline to get them back. I anyway, the librarian uh, found I could read the books rather quickly and said, well, you don't have to turn them in after two weeks. You can turn them in as soon as you finish. I'd opened the whole gate as a compulsive reader from that time on. And I think I had a lot of education before I started college, mainly because I had a very diverse background of reading. If it was printed, uh, printed I read it. Then uh, after I had uh, finished uh, at Whittier, I uh, married my wife, and we both were public school teachers for a year. Then uh, the war started, so I went in service and uh, was stationed at Great Lakes, Illinois, for a period of time. Uh, after that, got my commission and uh, went to uh, officer training for a short time, then went to sea. I was in uh, the Pacific War, actually the Okinawan invasion was a high point of that. Uh, some stoppage in other places at many t various uh, ports of call in the Philippines, uh, the Central Pacific, uh, the South Pacific, uh, all over the place. And finally the war ended and I decided, well, I better go back and get further education. Public school teaching was all right, but I had a little higher aspiration. So I enrolled at USC in 1946 as a graduate student. Uh, at that time, they had a huge avalanche of uh, veterans coming back on uh, the VA support we had from the government. It was about $75 a month, and you could have your tuition paid for, your books, and so forth. It was a very good investment on the part of the government. I went to USC and uh, with great expectations and a lot of enthusiasm. Meanwhile, I had a family starting, ultimately with four sons, actually five. Lost the first one, but... Uh, Four others I raised pretty well, and they're fine young people now, <laughs> curiously enough, nearing retirement. The uh, uh, 
stay at uh, USC there in the earlier years, the 1940s, the late 1940s, probably were highlighted by uh, two individuals, Paul Hadley, who later became a vice president at USC, a very close friend of my family. He was a guest in our home on many, many occasions, uh, just about every Saturday and uh, occasionally during the week. We became very close friends over the years, and he was a, a guiding light uh, in many ways to my own boys. Uh, they knew him well. We've uh, had that great tie until he finally passed away. I still feel a tie with him and a great obligation. He'd be one of the formative factors for me at USC. And Dr. von Kleinschmidt, I'd like to say a word about too. They tell a lot of ridiculous stories about him. Some I know that are totally false because I was involved in them. They just didn't happen. There's one I think you have on your record about uh, a Blue Jay coming into his room, his office, when he was entertaining Franklin Delano Roosevelt. That never happened. Whoever told you that story is using imagination or borrowed from my story about it. It was a time when we had the Swiss ambassador on the foreign leader program, which was something the Department of State had encouraged. They'd subsidized young people in the diplomatic service of foreign countries to come and visit us at government expense and see what we do around the country. And USC was one of the staging points for them. Paul Hadley and I both ran that, basically. And I remember taking the Swiss ambassador one time, he was one of my guests of the day, to uh, Dr. Van Kleinschmidt's office. That's when that incident of the Blue Jay occurred. Came into his office, and the blue on the floor, same color, right up to his desk, on top of the desk, and a little wired uh, pencil holder about the shape of an ice cream cone, and pencils. He picked a pencil up, dropped it out, another pencil dropped it out, reached down to the bottom, got a peanut, and then down on the carpet, trotted on out. The remarkable thing about it was, it was blue, just like the carpet. And the chancellor, when it got up on his desk, said, good morning, Dick. And the Swiss ambassador, with his mouth open, just watching, fascinated. <laughs> I don't know how he ever reported that to his own government, but <laughs> it was delightful to me. Uh, von Kleinschmidt, I think, has been maligned by some. I have nothing but the highest praise for the man. Uh, all you have to do is look at any old uh, who's who in America book and see all the astonishing things the man did. The prison reform, for example, no one knows about now. And all kinds of these things I've forgotten. They deal on the fact that we were a, a university that was living on the thin edge of finances. I think most of the time we lived that way. When I first went there, I was, well, I was at Whittier College, and I went there as a summer session student, 1936. At the end of my freshman year, I needed six more units to be qualified to play football in the varsity in the fall. So I decided to sign up for USC, which I did. And then uh, had the uh, six units taken, and it was at that time, I think we paid $6 a unit. I'm sure it was $6 a unit in 1936. I went back in 1937, somewhat horrified to find when I took six units again, it was $7 a unit. Meanwhile, I'd work at night in a hash joint Almost anything you could find in the way of part-time work you do in those years, the Depression years. Then I'd go back to Whittier and start again in football, baseball, whatever was going on, enjoying it. Got more serious about it when they gave, a, I guess, a primitive form of the graduate record exam. At that time, it was called the Princeton exam. They had farmed it out around the country a bit, and uh, uh, I was sort of a sleepy, uh, student. I didn't pay a great deal of attention to my student, my classes. I knew much of what they were talking about already, so it didn't seem important to me. This is not boasting. It was just a, a something I had done already just by my own choice without thinking of anything in the future. And then suddenly Whittier found that I had all this huge accumulation of trash, information, anything you want to talk about. I had something up here stored about it. And I had a good remembrance of all of these things, too, which I hope I still have. Uh, if I'd read it, I still remembered it. I could read very quickly, too, and had done a huge amount of reading by that time. One summer, I had an illness, and I decided I'd focus on World War I. 
I still have the reading list of 115 books I read in two months on World War I. I have many of those books upstairs right now. It was a, an interesting thing to do, and uh, it kept me uh, vitally intrigued with what's happening in the world. How did you end up coming to USC? Well, the summer session in 36 and 37, six units and seven units, uh, it was not six in the second one, but it was seven. That was a strange time. That was during the Depression, during the Civil War in Spain. I took a course called The Prevention of Poverty, a three-unit course in sociology, a very popular course at the time. They were talking about Sweden, the middle way between socialism and capitalism, not communism, etc. This was our world then. And being pretty independent because of that, I. Uh, had uh, very strong opinions about what was right and what was wrong. And I was a very conservative young man at a time when so many people were thinking the other way. The uh, uh, USC course uh, was a good one. There was one incident that I still remember. A girl in the class was a recruiting agent for the, uh, uh, I guess, the Communist Party, actually for the Abraham Lincoln Brigade and the Spanish Civil War. And uh, my roommate in college was attending the same class with me at Whittier. We'd both gone to USC for that summer session. And uh, she began to fix on the two of us as possible recruits. Well, he got it, less interested when he found that was her interest. He had no further interest in her. I was intrigued by that to find out what she was up to. And it uh, turned out that uh, uh, she was offering me a chance to go to Spain and fight in the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. <laughs> I knew the whole system, how they got them over there. They gave them a train ticket to El Paso, from El Paso, a train ticket to Veracruz. And there a ship would periodically would pick up people for various, and oil and other things from Mexico. It'd go off to the uh, uh, southern part of France, but on its way it'd always have a motor breakdown outside of Barcelona. Pull into the harbor at Barcelona, unload the ship, actually get the volunteers there. Next thing you know, you're enlisted in the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Yeah, well, once I found out about all that, that's all I needed to know. Thank you very much. Went in a different direction. Now, it was just the adventureness of a young man. Who, who hired you your first job at USC, and what was your first job at USC? First job? Yes, at USC. What, what do you mean, job employment? Yes. Well, that came after the war. I went back to Whittier College from there. Finished in 1940, and in 1940 I married also, and uh, started public school for one year, and then the war. Then I'm in the war. After the war, with the, uh, I taught already in public schools, had a credential, but uh, not happy with it. And here we had the GI Bill, so I thought, well, I'd better go back and work for not a master's. I wanted to go for the doctorate. So I went to USC immediately in 1946. They were on the quarter system then, ending it, and uh, enrolled in 1946. Uh, in the summer, I was hired for uh, some small job, and in the fall, uh, Dr. T. Walter Wallbank hired me to teach a uh, class in uh, uh, what was called Man and Civilization, a comprehensive history of the world. That was then being used to his textbook in 1,600 colleges and universities in the country. He's one of our great men, too, T. Walter Ballbank. Uh, he was, a, I think, one of the really uh, sleeping giants we had there, a very helpful man. That was a, a bit of employment, and then immediately uh, I bumped into Paul Hadley. Had a course from him. We had, that's when I got to know him quite well. My wife had known him before because he'd been a high school teacher in her hometown before the war, and uh, enrolled in his course. I liked it, and, uh, and I, that pulled me into the field of international relations. And in the fall, uh, of one, uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Wallbank hired me to teach a class all by myself instead of being a part of a bigger group. And I was given a night class, a three-unit course, paid $75 per unit, <laughs> kind of pitiful pay. It was all scratches 
as you could and uh, try to make a living out of what you had. We had a small house in Almaty at the time, had one son by then, had lost one, and had a second one on the way, 46. He was born in 46, number, number three. And uh, then in 47, uh, they began to give me heavy responsibilities like Tony Lazaro had his too. He started there as a graduate student. And uh, immediately found he had a certain talent, so they put him in there. They were hiring their own people, selecting veterans out of the, the more mature people. But uh, instead of using the young people they had as regular students of the old fashioned type, these were the uh, inheritors from the war. And many were hired then directly by USC and by many other universities too. What year did you uh, receive your doctorate degree? 1958, I think. That was a slow process because I was doing so many things at the time. So Just parked it on the mall because I was asked to do this, this, and this. And I had uh, the defect of never saying no. So uh, did you were most of your positions while you were working on your doctorate degree, were they all teaching positions? All teaching, except for advisement, academic advisement. That was under Paul Hadley. Uh, Dr. Robenheimer, the vice president, later he was a dean at the time of the college, had hired Paul Hadley to see students and help them plan their programs. And uh, uh, Dr. Robenheimer at the time, I think, was the dean of the College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences. Uh, we didn't have the president then, von Kleinschmidt was pushed aside as the chancellor, and they did search around for a president, made a mistake, uh, didn't work well, and then he finally uh, got onto Norman Topping in 1960. But meanwhile, it was all cut and paste, you know, a bit here and a bit there uh, internally in the university. You did have some stable people who had been there before the war, some new, very talented people in sciences added after the war. And USC was off and running. Then you had the next echelon down. These were the ones who were putting the fire out here, putting the fire out there. And there was a need wherever you were called, you help. And uh, uh, Paul Hadley would be in that category. He was finishing his master's and later his doctorate about the same time I was. His was in comparative literature, but he also taught international relations. That's the course I'd taken from him. Anyway, we uh, uh, went on from there to uh, more of a, a total career of academic advising. I inherited that and pushed it into a much bigger job than it was, because the need was so great for it. The students, uh, came to you kind of bewildered about direction and purpose, not like the GIs. When they came back, they had a goal they're going for it. And uh, it was a direct shot for them. But with the newer students, they came in going to college, but not sure why. Now, what do I do with this? What do I major in there? I still bump into them periodically in going through the rehabilitation of the broken hip. I met one that I had uh, helped out at the time. who went into physical therapy. And she was one of my therapists. <laughs> Curious enough, my doctor in the therapy sessions was uh, the uncle of uh, Matt Barkley, your quarterback right now. Uh, so uh, when you first when you first started um, working at USC, as well as going to school, what were your first impressions of of the university itself? Chaos and poverty both chaos and poverty. I'm not sure this is valid, but the story I'd heard was that uh, we had an endowment of $18 million, might have been. And that was uh, pitifully small compared to uh, any major schools. Uh, USC was living on a thin edge. Uh, we were given a directive one time that we should uh, uh, not uh, use the brexograph machines, as we called them then, printing out uh, page after page of questionnaires for the students to answer the questions, have the students bring blue books and write in those because they have to pay for the blue books. It saves them money for the university. Little trivial things like that. Uh, just a necessity, we did that. Mm -hmm. 
Well, which of the individuals, you've, you've, you spoke about Paul Hadley, but are there any individuals that influenced your career path while you were at USC? Yeah, a great number. Ross Berkus, B-E-R-K-E-S, director of the School of IR. He'd be the second man I think I'd name for that. And then after that, a great number of others that uh, became sort of inspirations for you more than guides. Uh, they did not help you on your career, except indirectly without even knowing it. Uh, you listen to a professor in his method of lecturing, borrow something from him. Uh, Don Rowland in history was one. Uh, Clayton Karras in business was one. Uh, later, I ran a course for high school teachers in the summer session on how to teach international relations in high school. And it was a good idea to do that, but uh, I used a number of our best lectures at USC, and I asked Clayton Karras to come in. I had heard him a time or two and thought, this man is really good. And he uh, started to talk to the students. He reached in his pocket, and he had a tooth, tube of toothpaste. And he says, I brushed my teeth this morning. He says, I forgot to put it back there. But he says, you know, there's something about that. And he began to look at it and he began to tell them a story. On this ingredient in there, this part on the cover, the tin and so forth, where it came from, the romance of it. This comes out of uh, the Turkish Peninsula. This comes from here. It was, that was resources around the world. He gave a brilliant lecture based on that tube of toothpaste. That reminded me of a professor at Whittier College who had the same gift. And I was recognized at USC as one of the better teachers it's because I studied it and found really the inspirational people that could do that effectively. This is a professor named Paul Smith at Whittier who had uh, who come in class one day. He's going to talk about something. He says, I have this Lincoln letter from Abraham Lincoln. Remind me before I'm through the lecture to make sure I tell you about this. And then he begins the lecture. And he periodically look at that and nod, oh yeah. Then he continue. And finally, at the end of the class, we're all waiting for this. What are you going to do that? He crumpled it up through the wastebasket. Brilliant. <laughs> it captured our attention all the time. <laughs> and just with that little device. Uh, still remember almost word for word what he said. Uh, those things stayed in memory. Well, I marked that and think this had a real gift. Don Roland, I mentioned. Well, Roland told me one time, he asked me to come in as a graduate student and give a lecture to his class. I stumbled onto that sort of thing, invitations from other faculty members for a young guy coming along who would give him a boost. They were very helpful faculty. Now it's a cutthroat, I think, more than anything else. But then you uh, tried to help the younger ones. I had all kinds of people around that kept putting a hand out for me if I needed it. Uh, Don Rowland, uh, uh, had me give a lecture in his class, and afterwards said, Norman, he says, you're trying to give far too much information. What you want to do is make a point, take a hub of a wheel, and you put a spoke in it here, a spoke in it here, a spoke in it here. Those are the reinforcement points to that hub, which is the focus of your lecture. Until you have all that, then you need to put it all together with a rim, and that'll be the last two or three minutes of your lecture. It was a brilliant concept. I adopted it. turned out to be very useful. It applies in many situations. But he was a very helpful man on that. And a number of them like that were there. At that time, older faculty liked to help you. Clayton Karras, he'd help you any time he could. He taught a six-unit course, three units in the fall, three in the spring. I was teaching a parallel course in geography, of all things. I taught geography, too. Too. Uh, rather than telling you about this spoke system, it was a, a, a way of making a cohesive lecture and having a point to what you're saying, that everything could be focused on that. And uh, that worked very effectively. I found later, though, the most uh, inspirational way to give a really brilliant lecture. I gave two that I think I would say were really first rate. And I did this thousands of times. But two, I'd say, were even I remember. Uh, one was uh, where uh, I was asked about uh, uh, a summer, summer honors program about how to categorize people and nations, a number of things, looking at interdisciplinary approaches and concepts. 
and I began to use something on my way into the university as a pad on the car seat as I'm driving, and put down A and K and W, just three letters that would tell me what I wanted to talk about. And then I decided, okay, the AKW, I know what I meant by them, the A for action. Uh, those nations or those uh, individuals who primarily start with an action. And there's knowledge and there's wisdom. And I would say the uh, A, K, W, that's the type of a person. Or the, and that's a dangerous person. They shoot from the hip, they make a decision quickly, a nation does the same thing. And there's no, 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 pur no purpose to it except just a big shot, a big shot. Uh, a pointed shot. And then uh, I began to work on the other side of it, the one with knowledge. You start with that, and then if you go to action, you're jumping too fast. Use the knowledge to pick up more and more so you have some comprehension of putting things together that are disparate. And then you have wisdom when you can do that. You can bridge things. And then you go to the action. So really the best way is a KWA not the very other alternatives of the alphabet. There are the AKW or KWA or whatever. You don't start with the knowledge, then the wisdom, or the wisdom and the knowledge. You had to do it the right way. And I'd always reinforce it by illustrations. I can give you one now if you like. Well, there's a... You go ahead. Uh, there's an Indian collection of fables, probably as old as uh, Aesop fables, called the Panchatantra. And uh, in the Panchatantra, a uh, story is told of uh, three young men who had gone to uh, an institution of learning, a college if you like, in modern terms, and had uh, graduated. Now, you didn't use these terms then, but this is the idea. They'd gone to a place to learn, and they'd learn three of them, and two were very, very intelligent, one not so bright. They thought, well, he's not as smart as we were, so they're wandering home now with all this knowledge. And they find this dead lion, L-I-O-N, and as they see that dead lion, one says, my knowledge has taught me how to take that dead lion and reassemble the skin and the bones and the flesh. And the second one said, my knowledge has taught me how to put life back into it. And the third one, who wasn't as bright as they were, he says, well, would you mind waiting a few minutes while I climb this tree? And they said, oh, you dullard, you're always behind us a little. You never were as smart as we were. Go ahead, climb the tree. So he did. And so the lesson in the Panchatantra is, senseless scholars in their pride made a lion, then they died. Uh, that uh, that's a good deal of wisdom to it, and I've used that in a lecture, by the way. But I, I said something really I want to go back to. You had two lectures that you said were brilliant. This is the one I'm going back to right now. One was when I was teaching a course in international relations. It was a, a sophomore course, a recruiting course. I had maybe 200 students. I used to learn their names by the third meeting. I tried to really force myself to do it. So I'd remember where they'd sit, and I'd never have to use a checkoff card for attendance. And I uh, could greet them by name, Henry, Joe, Arthur, whatever. I knew their names better than my own sons. Uh, I was confusing my son's name when I introduced them, but I never did with my students. Anyway, the uh, uh, students had a system of... I'd, I'd tell them at the very last lecture I'd give before the final exam, uh, one more lecture, and what do you want me to do on this last one? To go over a lecture I didn't finish in the semester? To review the test, what you're going to be facing? Or anything else you wanted me to do? You tell me I'll do that when I come in. So I just take it spontaneously, sort of the conceit of a young man, and there he's going to take off and do a brilliant job, you know. I came in this one time, and they, it was a large class that appointed a committee of three or four people who sat down and decided to embrace me on a tough one. So they wrote something and sealed it in an envelope. And I came in, I just remember bouncing on in, all the confidence in the world. I opened that and I was shattered. Dr. Ferdig, if you had only one more lecture to give in your life, 
what would you say? And I was, I said, you know, I've got to stop right now. I said, I'm really stunned by this. I never expected anything like it. It makes me reflect very quickly, and I've got to talk out loud so that I'm not going to hide anything from you. My first thought is, everything I've said over the years is garbage. I don't think I've ever said anything really important. I said, I've been under self-delusion on this. I said, they will have a funny thing that's happened. I happened to read something just by chance the other day that uh, St. John, the oldest of the apparent uh, disciples, had lived in his 90s. At least that's a, a tradition, I think, in some churches. And in his later years, uh, some of the uh, uh, older people around him would ask, you were there at the beginning. Is there anything more you can tell us before you leave this life? And he said, just one more thing, little children, love one another. And I said, that's what I talk on. It even shakes me out now to recall it. It was a tremendous touching thing for me of real reality. And I then began to get more serious about what I was doing and not just being a happy go lucky guy on the platform entertaining the class, doing a brilliant little job that looks superficially brilliant, no depth to it. And that made me into a much more serious scholar. And I don't mean scholar by writing, scholar by thinking. And I think I became immensely more effective after that. That was one. And uh, the other, I think, probably I'd keep uh, to myself. Uh, Henry Kissinger, when, on one occasion, was a, a USC uh, speaker at the Institute of World Affairs, which Paul Hadley now used to administer with Dr. von Kleinschmidt. It was a major program every December, and we'd have great speakers from across the country, round tables and so forth, about a four-day session. Uh, Dean Russ we had several times. I got to know him quite well. And uh, it was, uh, Kissinger was a big name at the time. Uh, he uh, had said one occasion, I remember this especially because it was so clever. The reason why politics and university is so dirty and low is because the stakes are so small. You got a key to the elevator, I didn't. You got a desk, I didn't, that sort of thing. You know, it's ridiculous. It was really true. He really touched on something that really was true at USC for a while. I think it's probably there yet. You, uh, you were at USC through a number of presidents. Would you like to have to discuss any of the major presidents at USC and your impressions of them? Well, Dr. Von Kleinschmidt to begin with, and of course the big man to me is Norman Topping, by a wide margin. I like Jack Hubbard, but Jack had problems. And uh, he had all kinds of potential, but the problems, I think, got in his road. Uh, I had admiration for his intellect, and he was a very good lecturer, very good mind, but uh, not the best of administrators. Topping had a brilliant vision of the future. Uh, when he first came to us, he said, within 10 years, we're going to double your salaries. By heaven, 10 years later, that was true. He was appalled at what we were being paid. And it was a, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't even go back to what we were being paid then. It was kind of pitiful. And uh, he, uh, 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 topping, after topping, I think uh, we went downhill somewhat. After uh, Hubbard, see, we had uh, uh, the uh, uh, Southern Methodist professor who was at uh, Zumberg? Zumberg, uh, Zumberg, who died of a brain uh, uh, tumor, uh, cancer in his brain. The last month of his life, he didn't know what was happening. Uh, I think he had the right instincts, but we had had a major civil war at USC that I got involved in, too. Uh, the backing Tom Nickel, and uh, we were opposed to Zorb Kropilian, who was, uh, uh, of course, the fill-in for Jack Hubbard. Uh, Kropilian was a... Uh, uh, a very good man in many ways, and really a, a, a problem in others. I'm being kind here, I think, because I had a real opposition to the man at one time. I've been much more forgiving since, or reconciled to what he was trying to do. I understand some of his problems better now than I did then. 
but he, uh, uh, for example, he uh, dismissed two of the best people we had at USC, Don Walsh and Don Keach. They were running the Sea Grant program, which was government subsidized. It was a brilliant concept by the government. USC was one of the leaders in what we were doing. We had these two big names. Don Walsh was on that wire that went down to the Marianas Trench, seven miles, the deepest man has ever gone. No man has ever been that far down. No deeper part of the ocean exists, so far as we know. But Don Walsh was on our faculty, and Don Keach had been uh, in the Atlantic uh, uh, searching for one of our lost submarines. Actually, I think he was working for Navy Intelligence, I believe, trying to find a Russian submarine, too, that might have uh, had some problem with our submarine. This is all stuff that was behind the scenes, but they were there running the Sea Grant program, and I think, as I recall from Don Walsh, they had chartered a helicopter to take some visiting dignitary from the mainland across to Catalina Island where we had our program going and we're going to uh, get him over there quickly by this means and Zorb who was uh, penny pinching maybe we needed it then I don't really think so but uh, he was uh, trying to save money and he really discouraged both not only that but anything like it so they just left they invited me to go along with them. Uh, you, you see them on TV periodically. The only man who's been down that deep. No one has ever been there since. That was back in the 1960s. Uh, they were first-rate men, both of them. Don Walsh is still alive. I'm not sure about Don Keach, but they were both gentlemen. Uh, <clears throat> I'm told uh, that the USC School of International Relations is the country's first such school. How long were you a member of the IR faculty and over what years? I was made a member of the faculty probably about 1948, about third year I was at USC, second year. Uh, I think Paul Hadley brought me in uh, to uh, teach a course of overloaded with the students and not enough faculties. And so they asked if I wouldn't teach something that I did and got off pretty well with it. I'd filled in for the geography department for one semester when nobody was there to teach it. You didn't show up after the war. We had students already signed up for it. I told Dr. Ovenheimer that we had this problem and he said, well, we'll just have to close it out and say they can't go to those. And I said, well, they're not that difficult. I can teach three of them, but one I can't do. I don't have enough knowledge in it. That would be... Uh, meteorology, weather forecasting, and so forth. And uh, but the uh, other three I can do. He said, "Fine, go ahead." I was well, we around USA then, and I did pretty well at that. In geography, I kept the department alive for a year till I hired a geographer. At the same time, I was teaching one class in international relations. I'd say it was about 1949, and I became full fledged faculty member are teaching a full load, uh, overload sometimes. <laughs> I have a catalog upstairs of uh, uh, courses I taught one semester, seven different courses in one semester. Now it's two or one, okay. seven in one semester. This is a killing space, you know. I, I just did it because I didn't know any better, I guess, than saying no. They needed it, so I did it. What were some of the high points in the, in the School of International Relations that you can recall? Well, the association with Ross Burkus, who had a brilliant mind. Uh, we'd play tennis on Saturdays, and frequently with his two children, two and his wife. Uh, they were lovely children. I still know them, keep in contact with them occasionally at Christmas. have great fondness for them. But he was a, a good man. He opened doors for me, as Paul Hadley did. And I'd have to say that uh, they opened the door, and then somebody else would pick me up, and the next thing you know, I'm launched in this direction, or this, or this. Uh, I got to a point where I was uh, vastly overworked. I didn't know it at the time. 
I was beginning to break under it. It was just too hard on me. And I uh, began to wilt with it without quite knowing why. And it led to uh, my taking a sabbatical for one semester, trying to regain my equilibrium and strength and see what was wrong, what was uh, puzzling me and pushing me down so far. I was overloaded. I looked back on the schedule I had then. It was a killing schedule. Five and six lectures a week at night. They needed the speaker. Sure, I'll do it here and there. I always said yes. I still had the tradition of helping that crisis period of the late 40s and early 50s. And uh, I didn't learn then, boy, you cut this thing here somewhere. So I finally did. After that sabbatical, I said, no more public speaking, not again. I've had enough. Uh, I've done enough for 20 years, or for those three or four years I did it. Then I began to think of overloading on the units I'm teaching. Seven courses are ridiculous when you have faculty teaching too. That's when I got more and more into administration. I was offered the associate deanship in the college, and I took that to help Neil Warren. I wasn't a great deal of help to him then because I was still rehabbing myself. And uh, after a period of time, uh, another dean came in to replace him, who was a bit of a problem. He lasted one semester less than that. I resigned. I really was uh, not going to continue. In fact, when I sent my resignation in, I uh, made it one that they could interpret if they liked his resignation of a uh, tenure, even too, if they didn't like what I was saying there. That I would not work for the man totally incompetent, without ethics, etc. They were pretty brutal in what I said. And Topping called me in and said something about it. And I said, Well, what should they do? And I said, Well, not for me, I said, but uh, you know his problem as well as I do. You're a doctor. I said, you're a surgeon, maybe. Operate and take care of it. Give him a happy spot in the university, a, a semi-promotion that looks bigger, and give him responsibilities that are going to be harmless. His idea of a questionnaire when he was a dean, find out why we didn't have classrooms all full from 12 to 1.15. Everybody signed up earlier or later. We've got to fill those classes at noon. Why do they do that? They never stop to think. It's lunchtime. Nobody wants to teach at lunchtime. He's going to teach in the morning, teach in the afternoon, break at noon. Well, he had to break that, he thought. Uh, a very competent man in his own field, but certainly not administration. Humiliating to women. I won't name him even. And pretty hard on the uh, uh, crude about it sometimes, uh, the women faculty. I remember us talking about uh, it one time when we were signing raises, uh, a small amount here and there, scattered around in the college. And women know that they don't need it to bypass. Uh, oblivious to uh, the realities of life. Um, I'm told that uh, you were among a small group of faculty and staff who were instrumental in opposing a proposed academic unit that involved the Middle East in the 70s. Is that correct? Uh, not quite correct. There was a, a major push toward a major grant, a series of grants, that came out of the vision of Dr. Bill Bailing, uh, now deceased, a very good friend. He was a professor of the Middle Eastern Studies. Uh, we had Arabic taught at USC at that time by uh, Middle East uh, Billy Center, Center, yeah. Bailing was a, uh, he'd been in Saudi Arabia for some time. He had very good contacts there. Uh, I was, uh, uh, I think, through the advisement office more than anywhere else. I was everybody's friend, so to speak. I uh, had uh, the Jewish students uh, pushing for me to become more prominent for their cause, and uh, very good students, and very, Bob Fratkin's one of them, a typical example. Uh, and I heard students the same way. And here, uh, this I'm thinking, I'll be very fair on this, it became a real civil war internally. I think uh, the external sources outside of USC got a little panicked by what USC might do if it had major grants from Arab countries. 
I had written my resignation the day that I accepted the assignment there, and the resignation was filed but not opened. It was sealed. And the first time this becomes, and I use the word anti-Semitic wrongly, the first time it becomes anti-Semitic, it's in, in the hopper. I've resigned from the Middle East Center. I gave that to Bailey. I told him what was in it, and I said, but don't open it because it's to be opened, and it's official the day you open it. And uh, if you read on that, fine, just come in and help us. Uh, I think he was badly misrepresented and portrayed. Maybe that was because people were so spooked at the time and uh, misjudged what we were trying to do. Echoes of that still probably are there at USC. I uh, was certainly part of it. I know that we had uh, great amounts of money promised to us, but what I was doing there, it seems to me, this is what we're in the business for. With 17, 15 million of endowment in 1946, here, we've got 50 million waiting on the line for you here. Major corporations. Major corporations uh, were jumping on this because they hoped it would give them some influence in Saudi Arabia. Well, by that, I seem to have a great number of Arab friends. So have. I uh, have uh, uh, three Arab students that uh, the father died. They were uh, uh, the sons of a, a very important Saudi man who was uh, the confidant, advisor, closest friend of Prince Abdullah, who was then the crown prince, now the king of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is not like the other countries around them. It's been relatively quiet so far. It's not going to stay that way. I had more faith in it, I think, than Bailing did. These were fine gentlemen, and uh, these three boys lost their father. Uh, I did things for them to help them finish at USC. Uh, we had to fly home to do things back. I had to get them an incomplete here and help them extend the incomplete petitions and so forth until they finally got their degrees. One still sees me, he calls me father all the time he sees me. Never Dr. Furtick, always father. A very sensitive lad. Uh, all immensely wealthy, by the way. In fact, he was out here this summer <laughs> in the icebox in the other refrigerator in the, in the garage. There's a big box of chocolates I have. He brought me. I'm going to open it on my birthday. Uh, Khalid Aliban was his name. Oh, the Aliban brothers did a good job, but they needed some help. Uh, like a Arab custom of burying the dead in the desert the day they die, wrapped in white, buried in the desert. Bin Laden, they did that. They wrapped him in a white sheet, buried him at sea. As they claimed afterwards, I'm sure they did. I'm sure they photographed it, too. This is an Arab burial for what we've given him. So we didn't try to humiliate him like the English used to do, hang him from the nearest tree and then sew him up in a pigskin. Couldn't defile him any worse than that. Uh, no, that was very proper. Anyway, uh, Bailing had, uh, I think, been shot at a little unfairly. Because I was working with him, I was identified with it, too. And I think I never did tell anybody about the resignation I had written. And the fact I still had a great deal of faith in what Bailing had tried to do. They had uh, the, the salvage, uh, salvage operation was I was really on and kept the contact with the Arabs when it died. And after a while, everybody's coming to me because I'm the only one that seemed to be able to reach the Arabs. Uh, there are different parts of the Arab world that we have to understand. They're the, uh, those that are the Shiites and those that are the Sunni. The Sunni are Saudi Arabian, Transjordan, etc., and the Shiites are a different branch of Islam, like Catholic and Protestant, hostile toward each other. They're in Iran. I was in Iran two times for the university, got to know both groups very well, had friends in both. I was horrified when the revolution occurred in Iran. I knew it was going to happen. I'd been uh, given an exit interview by, uh, I think, the director of their secret police, Savak, uh, and uh, asking what my impressions of his country were. And I was pretty frank with him. I said, I think you have trouble coming. I said, partly because you have your government all concentrated here in Tehran. 
And while you have about every 10th block or so, a little block of fortresses with soldiers, that's not going to do anything. You, they can topple that tomorrow. I said, you ought to have your city there and let anybody stay in it as you please. Move your capital out to the provinces. Some are very quiet. Limit the population. You don't need a lot. You just need administrators there and custodians to clean it up. It didn't, and it happened. They caught him. They finally killed him too. A vicious thing that happened. It had been down the drain ever since. They were heading very well toward a first-rate country. Now they're a fourth-rate country, uh, way down the list. Of, uh, as a country that needs nourishment and help. Poorly administered, people with grudges to carry. It's a, a tragic loss. There were very good people there. I don't I had a great deal of admiration for them and a good deal of ties. At one time, I guess I was a uh, real contact with the Saudi, with the uh, Iranians. We had the largest Iranian student body in the country. We had 900 Iranian students. And mainly, I was the one to look after them in various ways academically, see how their progress was going. I went to Zohar Papillion uh, when the revolution occurred in uh, Iran, and the revolutionaries took over. All that had changed. I said, you know, we're going to have colleges calling us, saying, what is USC going to do? Because we are the largest contingent in the country. And because it's known we have that, what is USC going to do about all these Iranian students you have, how do they get their tuition paid? How do they get their credits transferred? Can they continue here? What if they're recalled and refused to go? All these questions have to be answered. Zora was a good man, but no imagination. No, no, no won't happen. That was a Friday. Monday, panic call from Zora. Come to meet me quickly with a committee. He always had committees around him. <laughs> I'll tell you another one there if I can remember it. But, uh, so what did you do? We talked about it right then. We decided we will not stir a thing as they call for them to go back. Those who want to go back and go back. Those who want to stay and continue to study here. If the Department of State says they can stay, we'll keep them here and wait to see if we can negotiate with the new government to pay their tuition. At first, they were not going to. We had. Uh, Oh, three that were especially under my wing that uh, had uh, been subsidized really by USC mainly. Just people put a little money into it so they could live and they deferred their tuition for until, until we heard from their government. Uh, they finished and finally, finally actually got it paid for. But after things had quieted down there, then they began to decide, well, we do want that kind of rain back here. We need it. So bring them back. Uh, that was one. The other one I said, uh, the hard one about the Middle East Center, though, that was uh, the most difficult time I think I had at USC because of the hard division and the misrepresentation of the facts. Uh, Bailing, I think, took a very hard shot that was just not fair. I was somehow protected. It showed up in Time magazine. And in, I still have the magazine somewhere around the place where it says uh, about this Middle East Center controversy at USC and how uh, it was promoted by this one named Bailing. <laughs> they called him back before the SEC, Security and Exchange Commission, to, uh, about all the money we were going to raise and how they were going to do it. And of course, he went back and testified. And it said with his name and a dean. Nobody named me. That was protection from all his Israeli friends. They kept it out of time, but put his name in. Uh, I, I think both sides were wrong. Bailing a little hard-headed. After they hit him enough times, he just got stubborn. And uh, in my case, uh, people, uh, I have to be honest with you, three closest friends to me today of the graduate students, or students I had, are all Jewish. Uh, Bob Fraction being one, uh, Bruce Cohen being another, Steve Orlikoff, one of the big ones, a global uh, figure today, and uh, oh, maybe one or two others I could say. These are very prominent people. 
strong backers of me. I also have strong backers of the Arabs. That's a good place to be between them, so both like you. They both invited me to be at one time the sponsor of the Arab Student Association, of the Israeli Student Association. And I said, no, I already have one. I couldn't have two. The regulation was you could sponsor one international group. I was sponsor of the West African Student Association. That was a, a different cup of tea entirely. <laughs> what are uh, some of the most notable changes in USC? Notable what? Notable changes that you encountered at USC mm. while you were there. Once they got their budget balance, began to raise money, they began to do things that uh, were badly needed, not just buildings. That's uh, too difficult. Find somebody who likes the idea. Uh, it becomes a monument for him because he's named for it. But uh, the real things that had to be done would be in academics. You need reinforcement for certain areas. You needed to, uh, uh, I said, clean house in some ways. Uh, Bob Doxson in business, one of our really great men, uh, dean of the School of Business, later became head of CalFed, uh, saving the loan and a very prominent man in that field. Bob Doxson had uh, created something that uh, uh, a joker in the faculty said, named the Doxson Horror. It's stacks of papers. He, uh, uh, energetic as all get out and imaginative too. It was a survey of the entire university and you would be appointed to several different groups. Uh, I, as a, a dean at the time, was appointed to uh, medical school, the School of Nursing, and uh, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, biology. These I have to go with the committee and we interview them. How many students you have, how many faculty. Nobody had known what we really had and done the overview of the whole thing, getting it all pictured so we know what we have. And uh, I still remember going with the committee to the physical therapy, occupational therapy people in one of the bungalows we had left over from World War II. They were still used for instruction or administration. This is, I think, for physical therapy. I'm not sure. It might have been occupational. Or the committee, and we asked them a number of the basic questions that Doxon had set up for us. How many on your faculty? How many students enrolled? Uh, what are your budget needs? What are the uh, axes you have to grind, and causes or purposes, etc. I remember this woman, I don't remember her name, she was so sweet, she said, and either physical therapy or occupational therapy. And when we just finished a little interview for that, checking off all the points that we had to make for our contribution to the survey, total survey of the university, she said, can you help us get this cadaver out of this building? I said, what? The medical school apparently had taken the cadaver there for some exhibition and left it. And about a month later, still in the closet. <laughs> the little things like that made it kind of fun. Oh my goodness. Um, thinking back to the students that you served, who were some of the outstanding ones? Well, well one of my most outstanding students, uh, I wouldn't say outstanding academically, I'd say outstanding salvage cases, was Bob Pratkin. He was a brilliant student, there's no denying that. But here was an unshaven, sort of a raunchy uh, student sitting in class doing nothing. And I'd given a uh, course in European diplomatic history, a, a senior level course, uh, a series of lectures, a midterm exam. Came in the midterm exams, I passed back, and Bob's I held back. And he raised his hand, he said, my, my exam, the Bob come to me after class, it's up in the office. So after class, he brought it up there with me, and I said, Bob, I said, you're wasting your time here. Who's paying your tuition? His mother. Why don't you save her the money and just drop out? I thought, kiss this boy hard. And he got mad. That's what I wanted him to do. And he said, well, by God, I'll show you, I'll stay in your class. I said, you got an F, complete F. I can't believe it's so ridiculously F. If I could give you a Z, I'd give you a Z. It's the worst thing I've ever seen. It's just a waste of time. 
I'm going to stay in your class, I'm going to beat it. But, yeah, yeah, I've heard that. Just beating enough to get him angry. He stayed very quietly, studied. Next test, A, perfect. Next final exam, A, perfect. I surprised him. I wiped out the first score and gave him an A. He came up to me and just happy about it, all get out. He said, you changed me. I said, Bob, how would you like to be a reader? Second semester. Jumped at it. <laughs> uh, then he comes to see me after the first week of what to do. And how old are you, Bob? Twenty, something like that. I said, look at your fingernails. My gosh, no fingernails. What do you do, bite your fingernails? At 20 years of age, still doing it? Got angry, walked out. Mm -hmm. Two, three weeks later, he comes back and stubs the fingernails, puts them in front of me. <laughs> Bob was a wonderful kid. I look on him just like a, one of my own sons. Uh, I kicked him a few times. He t responded beautifully. He turned out to be a top student, brilliant student, published papers, very good man. Had three or four sons with him one time when he came back for a reunion at USC. They were uh, at least high school age, maybe older. And I said, your father had great gifts. He could have been anything he wanted to be. But he just didn't want to move. All I did was prod him a bit, and he moved, which is really true. I think what I had going for me there, by talking to so many students, uh, I picked up a trick that I used to call people reading. I'd get uh, signals from them. I've, I've had several from you, by the way. You don't do that uh, consciously. Uh, I see a movement of the shoulder, a response to something I'm saying, or the intensity of look or something else. You can pose on that, but not long. If you're trying to deceive me, I could see that going for a little while, but you can't do it indefinitely. And by reading the body signals you get from a person you're talking to, or by any of a, novel, a dozen other ways to read a person, too, on attitude sort of things and all. I picked up the gift of doing that, and I think that was a big thing that touched a number of different students. I could read them. And I could probably do just the right thing for them at the time. Very lucky on that. And that makes me now get humble again because I missed on two. It was suicide, and I didn't pick up the signals. That's still a hard one. Uh, anyway, uh, it was a, a sort of thing you, you cultivate after a while. You get pretty good at it, and I, I think I got very good at it. Uh, I had two girls come in one time to his advisement. They were timid. They were reinforcing each other by being together and uh, trying to figure out what they should do about academics and their career and so forth. And I thought this timidity they have to get over and have to uh, be a bit more assertive, but don't change them too much. Uh, see what you can do just to get them focused on, I have something to give now. Let me be in a position where I can give it. And by several meetings with them, I encouraged both to go for teaching credentials. They turned out to be brilliant teachers. One went to Scotland on an exchange program, wrote to me a long letter about uh, being in Scotland there and what she'd done. Could I get a football autograph with the players, including O.J. Simpson? So I went to Craig Ferdig, not my son, but a uh, good friend, quarterback at one time at USC, now deceased. And I asked Craig, uh, can you get me a football autographed uh, by uh, all the whole team, including O.J.? He said, sure. He got it for me, and I mailed it across to her in Scotland. And picture she sent me a presentation there. They have it mounted there somewhere in Scotland. Then she came back to this country. They've got a trophy now that's worth thousands of dollars. <laughs> He's uh, pretty well destroyed most of the stuff that he had. He, he couldn't sell it, so it doesn't get any marketing. Anyway, and he's serving a long prison sentence, too. But uh, it was uh, these two girls, in any case, I decided, let's get them into teaching. Uh, after my wife had passed away here four years ago, I got a very nice letter from one of them. The other had a health problem. And she related to that one. And this one had uh, put her son through USC 
She had uh, a place in uh, San Pedro, had uh, taught schools, now was retiring. Um, hearing from her after all, leaving USC, a whole career in teaching, and now I hear from her at retiring. That's a, a gap of 30 years or 35 years at least. And it's nice to hear from somebody who remembers you 35 years ago and renews the contact after 35 years. And that's kind of heady wine. Uh, well, you've talked a, a, a little bit about some of your students. Uh, can you think of any other um, maybe accomplishments while you were at USC that you're most proud of? Well, I, the lad, I wish I could remember his name. He's the one that produced the film, An Officer and a Gentleman. Do you know the film? Yes. Do you know who directed it? A USC student. Uh, he, he was uh, reported, I think I have it over there somewhere on the table. I'm going through old archives here, trying to burn and throw away what I don't want. But he had said something in uh, one of the USC publications. They're rather proud of him for having done that film. And why did he major in international relations? And he said, he named me and said that I had talked to him about it, and the background of it, and what had happened, and he liked it. And why did he come to USC? Because he had this grant. His parents didn't have much money. He's a very wealthy man now. But uh, his parents didn't have much money. But he had this scholarship offered that uh, gave him a tuition and a little money to spend as he needed for books and uh, maybe a, a little extra for himself occasionally. They got that in USC because I pushed it. I said, I remember telling uh, John Canelon, the dean at the time, look, John, we're going for top athletes here. You go out and hunt all over the country for the best quarterback or the best this or that. Why don't we do that for the best scholars? John took the idea to the Board of Trustees. They liked the idea. So they put up what they called the trustee scholars. Ten of the brightest students at USC, the brightest ones we admitted, given free room and board and tuition and a little spending money. Uh, some of the faculty, by the way, contributed to that, too. One faculty member I remember very fondly was Dean Hansey, uh, who used to put money into my summer program that was dealing with gifted students, too. That's another story. Huh. I don't want to get deviating into that yet, but, uh, uh, well, that's all right. I think I said enough on that. Um, well, I, we're, I'm, focus I'm winding down, and I'm looking at what are some of the most memorable moments of your career here at USC? The most memorable, I think, was that moment when I opened that envelope and said, if you only had one lecture to give, what would you say? I, uh, that gave me an idea, which I, I think is kicking around USC now. If somebody else has come up with it, he's plagiarized it. But I thought, you know, this would be a good thing to have all faculty in their later years. You're invited now to give a special lecture. And were it just that way, if you had only one more lecture to give, what would you say? Then you can throw this whole discipline aside and talk on something else if you like. And see what they have to say. They have, by that time, they should have some wisdom and something that is useful to say to the next generation. And that would be sort of an honorary thing. You pick your best faculty to do this. And I could name you dozens of faculty that should be entitled to do it. And if they were given that same kind of a challenge. And I thought, you know, if we did that, a legacy lecture, I called it. I heard that name now being kicked around at USC by somebody I think was trying to uh, push it as his idea. It's not, I'm not jealous. My idea from a long, long time ago. So mm. who, would, who would you ask to give these last lectures, these legacy lectures? Legacy lectures, that's yeah. what I was going to call them. Who, who are some of the faculty that you would choose? I would choose them now, yes. Who? I'd choose T. Walter Wallbank. I have a list right over there on the table. You can reach behind you. A pad there with names. Ah. I thought I'd like to be able to say this to you. Richard Van Alstyne, uh, he was a uh, diplomatic history, American diplomacy mainly, very shy gentleman, a real scholar, 
not much of a lecturer and uh, a reserve person. Uh, we both taught night school classes, and I thought he's a kind of lonely guy. I'll take him to dinner with me sometime. We went across to, to the little uh, restaurant, I think, that used to cater to John McKay and uh, had dinner there and got to know him pretty well. I had his son in class. His son was a brilliant boy, Bill Van Alstyne. I said, Bill's one of the brightest kids I ever had. Uh, he said, he's, he's a good boy, he's very smart. He went to Duke, he's teaching law school. Law school at Duke, brilliant kid. And uh, I got to know him through that, through his son. And he, I'm the one who wants to teach his course if he took a sabbatical. So I'm teaching in American diplomacy. I'd never had it before. That's what we won. Another would be uh, J. Eugene Harley, a gentle old man in political science. J. Eugene Harley. He'd be forgotten, but any student back in over the 1950s, early 60s, would remember him. Uh, unmarried, drove a big old Packard car, I think. Uh, a very old one, still ran very well, but very kind man, an idealist. He had hoped the United Nations was going to solve wars. I think he'd attended the United Nations meeting in 1920, and he preached the United Nations International Organization. This is the answer and all. A really fine idealist, high ethics. I remember saying one time, God didn't create this world. Dad was blown up. I'm not sure he did create it. Maybe he did create it for us to blow up. <laughs> uh, I have no idea what the attitude of the good Lord would be there, but he had a very idealistic view of the future and uh, became a very good friend, encouraging to all students. He would be failing his course. He'd treat you with the greatest kindness and encouragement and pat on the back for even a trivial bit of progress. A good, a wholesome attitude, a wholesome attitude uh, uh, that could help students. If you needed somebody to just listen to you and sympathize with you and give you a little encouragement, he'd be the one to go to. He'd be another one then. And the next one would be, let's see, Hans von Kerber, a legendary figure. Hans von Kerber was a German nobleman who had uh, been in German East Africa, later Tanganyika, British East Africa, then Tanganyika and then uh, now an independent country. He was there in 1913. He was a, a linguist. I first met him in 1946. And when the School of International Relations and the Department of Asian Studies and one other department, all four, in one big room on the third floor of the administration building, above the uh, president's office on top. No. the further down the chancellor's office. Uh, top floor up there, it's a big room, it's about four times the size of this whole living room. And in one corner section, we had a little bookshelf there, typewriter, desk, a phone, school of international relations, uh, Asian studies there, another one over here. A uh, chap came in from the war in 1946 with uh, some rolled up manuscripts. He'd been shot down over western China during the war, and while there, he'd found a number of stele, which are uh, big monuments with inscriptions on them, carved into them. He'd made uh, charcoal rubbings of them. And these were things that had never been seen before. Came back with rolls of these, just as a hobby. Well, they, they finally got to him and got him out of there. But he, just to keep himself busy, kept doing that. And uh, I brought, brought the Ocene out thinking they might say something and asked if anybody could interpret them. Well, I just knew that old gentleman in the corner was a linguist and been all over the world, done everything he might. I saw, I talked to the man in the corner there. He went to see Dr. Von Kerber. That was my first introduction to Von Kerber. And Von Kerber, I remember holding one up. Ah, ah, this is 13th century Mongol. <laughs> It blows your mind, a man could do that. And he starts to quote it. This is from the Valley of 10,000 Beatitudes. Beautiful language. And uh, he begins to quote it. Uh, well, the boy got his answer, and that was enough. I never saw him again. But I got curious about Ron Kerber. 
And uh, uh, later when I was doing the advisement office, I heard about him from his students. Uh, I remember walking by his class one time and hearing him actually say, give a lecture, and I listened, it was so good. I stayed in the hall, and he's talking about his uh, Asiatic concept of God, was the name of the course. Asiatic concept of God. He'd been to Tibet, he'd been to Mecca as a Muslim, a collector of religions, collector of languages. He spoke Swahili, he spoke German, he spoke French, spoke English, must have had eight or ten languages, a dozen maybe at least. And he said, they're not difficult. I, I, I can get by in three months, I can learn it. Well, the people who can do that, and he was one. At that time, we never even had Social Security at USC. That came in a little later, and he was one of the earlier ones where you just worked for your salary. And that was it. When Kleinschmidt hired him right after the war, when he was released by the British, he'd been given parole in India, where he was coming out of Tibet and found that Germany was at war with Britain 1914-1918. So he's kept as a POW, sort of as an honored guest in India, and given parole, meaning you wander around you please, but don't do things you shouldn't do, otherwise you're back in jail. And he played it carefully, and then went to Indonesia. At that time, the Dutch East Indies. And when he went to Indonesia, that's when he got his ideas of the Asiatic concepts of God. And I remember walking by his classroom door and he's saying, a very enchanting way of talking to about these uh, uh, curious little wood sprites they have there. He said, the angelic things, they move around quickly in the woods. And he's saying it so cutely to the class, they begin to laugh. Don't laugh, I've seen them. I didn't know the guy's kidding. It's emphasis, he's playing games as a lecturer. I was really serious, but it made me intrigued with him. Now I know he was serious. I got to know him very well. He became one of the close friends I had for years. Finally died, he retired under hardship with uh, virtually no social security. Uh, Dr. Von, Dr. Walbank uh, lived near him uh, down in uh, um, Oh, a town England from San Diego. And uh, he sort of looked after him periodically. He lived on goat's milk and whatever he gets in the way of little food from people. We took clothes to him even, my wife and I. A wonderful man, but uh, just uh, one of those people from the old system that had no security when they retired. Now you have a whole list of other folks there that oh, you... Other professors, yeah. Other professors. Well, let's go beyond Bunt Kerber. Uh, Walter Wolbeck, I mentioned, the Man on Civilization course. He put us on the map when we didn't have much national visibility. He'd written this brilliant book of a comprehensive history of the world, a two-semester course called Man on Civilization, and it became a standard text in 1,600 colleges and universities across the country. That was high visibility for USC of this man. And the military bought it and turned it out in paperback. Great big volume with paper covers, not hardback, to teach the officers. Anybody going into the military, getting a, uh, a commission, know this. We had people in World War II who couldn't tell you England's that direction or this direction. You have no idea, no orientation whatsoever of the world and where things are. But he gave you a picture of what had happened in the rest of the world, all condensed together. The Panchatanta story I told he has in his book. He let the graduate student teach sections of it. He educated a whole host of graduate students. One of the big ones, yeah. Von uh, Kerber, Wallbank, uh, Earl Bolton. Earl was there a short time. Earl had been uh, with uh, Naval Intelligence in Los Angeles. Again, going through old papers, I just found a letter from him. I'd recommended one of our students, a graduate student, for a direct commission and in his field, in naval intelligence. And he wrote me a thank you on that and said, uh, uh, send us any more you can get in the Army, he's a good one. Uh, then the next thing I know, Earl was teaching a class with me at night next to, in the bungalow with two sections to it. I'm teaching man and civ over here, a Wallbanks course. He's teaching a course over here. Meanwhile, he's going to law school. He decided to go to law school. 
he went to law school, and when we had uh, picked the wrong combination to run USC, a troika, as we called it, three different people, and include uh, one who was really a disaster. He, uh, they're useless. I don't want to use the names now, but they didn't do much for USC. Yeah, well, the three of them were running the place. Well, that was an illustration. No, that's not the, that's, that's the focus. Maybe that's what you got to do. Bolton, yeah, back to Bolton. He was uh, one of the three. He graduated from law school, had taught there for a while, practiced in law, made him one of the three, three vice presidents, Troika meaning three in Russian. And by having the three of them run USC, one for business, Fisher, one for fundraising, big and consequential, and then Earl Bolton. Earl Bolton was a good one. Bolton uh, died at age 74, became the number two man at Berkeley as an administrator. He's a brilliant lawyer, but a brilliant administrator as well. And he did a number of the changes when we were really low on the totem pole, academically, financially, every other way. He's the one that gave a little spark plug to us that nobody else was doing at the time. So I like to remember him. And then Harold von Hoffa, who just passed away about this past year, I think, the German department, uh, had imagination, flexibility. And uh, it extended beyond his own department. He had a better view, I think, of the university than most of the deans. Uh, he had strange experiences. He told me of one. He was teaching German, riding the streetcar to go home in Los Angeles. We had streetcars then. And uh, I guess he didn't have a car. But after a lecture he'd given, he's got his German textbooks here, and he's looking through them, but he's preparing the next day's lecture. Somebody reports him. <laughs> a German spy. <laughs> next thing you know, he's being asked by some people <laughs> who look a little strange to him who he is and what he's up to. Well, nothing like that at all, but a real principal guy. He just died at age 97. But I remember him with a great deal of respect and fondness. Now, one other thing I want to say here that there's not another person. It's uh, an organization that uh, played a role, I think, in helping many people at USC. It was an organization called Pergamus. Nobody will remember it now. It's named for a, a city in Asia Minor, Pergamus. I think John. St. John was there at one time. Uh, Pergamum, I think, is the Latin for it. But in any case, Pergamus was a society that met once a month in a restaurant at that time, Rudy's, over in Crenshaw, and now basically a black area. At that time, it was uh, mainly white. A lot of USC people lived there. But we had a meeting there about once a month, and there were no deans, only faculty and graduate students. And as a graduate student, faculty hyphen between both, of, in my case, I was invited to become a member, which is an honor. But to become a member, you had to give a lecture. And it had to be on something unrelated to your background, what you're teaching, what you're interested in at USC, something totally unknown about you. Give that lecture. That seemed like a nice challenge to me. I had something already going. So fine, and I gave a lecture. It turned out to be a, a big hit. Uh, by that time, I'd learned a few tricks in lecturing. And, uh, I had them sort of charmed. It was a history of organized crime. I think I knew more about uh, Chicago in the 20s and 30s than uh, probably anybody in Southern California. Uh, I got so close to it at one time, I was warned to get away from it. And that was from the other side, uh, an army getting too close to cut it off. I went to the old LA Record, which was a newspaper in Los Angeles, in preparation for that, and I asked to be able to use their morgue, which is their archives of the previous issues. And they dug out these clippings by a man named Dennis Sprague, an author, who was really an immigrant from Chicago with a false name, uh, writing for the record on uh, organized crime in California, in Los Angeles. Well, I had some background in it, 
I just studied in Chicago during the war just as a matter of curiosity. And I had ties with it when I was much younger as a boy. We had a couple of the uh, types like that as near neighbors, killing his husband, uh, killing the wife and some other guy. I'll leave the names out. They were very prominent killings, 1930, New Year's Day. Got off on the uh, unwritten law. He's fooling with my wife, we're gonna kill him. Wasn't true. Mafia stuff. Mafia wasn't even used then. They used the Union Siciliana term. Sicilian Union, it was called then, in Chicago. It really wasn't big in Los Angeles, small. But I had ties into this, not, I don't mean being involved in it, I had contacts in it. And I got information most people never got. And Dennis Sprague was the same sort of thing. He was using a false name, though. He'd been warned to get out of Chicago, but he's a journalist, so he has to get a job. He worked for the record. Every envelope of his clippings they brought out for me to read had a warning on it. Warning, danger of libel. So I had to be careful what I selected out of it. And I gave a lecture on organized crime in the United States that nobody had heard of there, stuff that nobody knew. And to this day, I think some of it hasn't been portrayed, though they do a good job with TV now and going back and rehearsing a lot of this, as more people can now speak openly about it. But I grew up on the tough side of L.A. and uh, had known a couple of these people and had known actually one had been with Capone. I knew that Capone had come to California at one time. The police had led him down to the station, put him back on the train, said not in Los Angeles, and that was it. The only contact he had with L.A. Next time he came to California was Alcatraz. And uh, I could go on that one for a long time, don't want to. Leave that one aside. So anyway, that was dealing with uh, uh, Pergamos. I gave the talk there, and we had some great people come in talking about something unrelated to their academic interest. Mine was totally unrelated to it. Meanwhile, I've got professors asking me to come and give that same talk in their class until I was told I was getting too close, and I stopped it. I think maybe one of the students had told an uncle or somebody else who might have had the contacts that were better than mine. Anyway, uh, that was the dark side of my life. Let's see. Uh, uh, Pergamus, uh, it should be remembered because it was a, a, a hearing ground for new faculty. You'd bring new faculty in, and you'd get to know them from a different dimension. Uh, we had a Professor Angerman. This is a name I wanted to mention. I was really taken by him because he uh, had uh, uh, majored in engineering. He was a German immigrant who jumped ship in the 1920s in New Orleans and uh, decided after a while he liked this country and would like to stay here. So next time a German ship came through, he told him he was here illegally, he took him on board, took him back to Germany. Then he applied for immigration, came over, became a citizen, got his education in mechanical engineering, faculty member of the School of Engineering. He was now giving a lecture in Pergamos at Rudy's Cafeteria, or Rudy's Restaurant, rather, in uh, Crenshaw. Anyway, he, uh, he gave the lecture that uh, none of us were prepared for. He was a tough-talking man with a bit of an accent, not much. Angerman was his name. I don't remember his first name, but he said uh, he was going to not lecture about anything in engineering, which is forbidden, but something that's strictly for me, nobody knows about. I'm going to tell you about my poetry. And that was really shocking to me. This hard talking, tough talking, Germanic accent and all, I'm going to talk about his poetry. And he began to recite poetry he'd written and very touching, brilliant poetry. Now that was interesting to me for a very good reason. My wife was a very brilliant poet, nationally recognized. Three of her poems were up there in frames. One won a national award, uh, published two books in it. Uh, she came on very strongly in the field and uh, was a great, uh, uh, really a, a great person in her own field of poetry. She's well known all over the country. Uh, 
He was a man to write poetry, I didn't know that. I wrote one poem in my life, which I wrote for my wife. I couldn't recite it now, I wouldn't want to. I'd like to remember it though, so it doesn't tip on my tongue, but lost back there. Anyway, uh, uh, he was a poet, and uh, it was uh, exciting to hear this man, this tough man, that likes poetry. I never liked it, frankly, except I memorized a lot of it as a boy. And schools at that time required you to learn poetry or certain things by rote. You had to memorize them. Charles Light Brigade, third grade. Uh, under a spreading chestnut tree, the village smithy stand, second grade. I'm serious. I, these were all things I had to do in school. A whole host of poems that I learned. And um, stay with me to this day. Most of them I can pick up again. But I never wrote poetry except that one that I, well, not too bad, it couldn't have been published, but I feel I said something nice to her. And she wrote brilliant poetry. One up there is the Sistina, which is the hardest kind of poetry to write. Uh, we had some mathematical formula where you take the last word on the fourth line, which becomes the first word on the first line, back and forth mechanically. And in the last three verses you compress so one word comes in the beginning, one in the middle, one at the end. Beginning, middle, and end. Beginning, middle, and end. Different words were taken out of the last words of the poems. To contrive something like that with any meaning is very hard. But she wrote that brilliant thing. So anyway, I was interested in poetry, and Angerman struck me as being one of the really strange people at USC. This hidden side of this man who's hard living, hard hard drinking too, hard cursing, he was a profane man, but admirable in his poetry, a very sensitive person inside. Uh, things like that, uh, they stay with you a long, long time. Uh, the imprint, if you like to stamp it, you can't shake it off. A stamp could be there as a, um, an unpleasant thing as well as a pleasant one. I've talked about pleasant ones, many unpleasant ones too. Most of those I'm blotting out now deliberately. I think at this stage in life I've decided to make peace with the hostilities I felt for a long time, uh, judgments I've made that were wrong. Uh, I'm not uh, doing this uh, for any spiritual reason. I'd like to think it is, but I'm just doing it because I think it's a wholesome thing to do. Uh, I'm reminded there to illustrate that of my father-in-law, who was a, quite a famous Methodist minister at one time. Ran for Senate in California and almost got it. But he was a, a crusader, cleaning up politics in Los Angeles, etc. And uh, a very hard man. But, oh yeah, he uh, had been instrumental in nailing the district attorney for the city of Los Angeles, Ezra Keyes, K-E-Y-E-S. Keyes had done something very dishonest. And Schuller nailed him for it in his pulpit and in his publications. The newspapers picked it up. We had five different newspapers at that time in Los Angeles. Only one now, and not a very good one. But we had five then, and it was reported all over the place. Uh, we, uh, he, had Asia, he was instrumental in nailing Asia Keyes the jury sent Asia Keys to 11 years in San Quentin. And uh, he got out in about four years, good behavior. He'd been dishonest in his job, given a hard sentence, but not going to carry it all out. It's not easy. And on the street, my father-in-law met him one time. He told me this story himself. He said, I looked at him, just delighted. Asia, how are you? Bob, how are you? I haven't said, shake hands. And suddenly they remembered the hostility they'd had before enemies on either side. One guy nailing him, he goes to jail, he had a horrible experience, and here's a man who really triggered him. Uh, I thought uh, that's a strange thing to have happen, but I respect it and I think now I'm learning it. And that's what I'm trying to do now, is uh, make peace with the things that I've had of the past that I've made mistakes on. One I can't still quite cover the two suicides. I've tried that, and it's hard yet. Uh, one was a boy who came in to see me, disturbed on something as obvious. He was not a student at USC, 
But uh, I guess he was a boy in his late twenties, and he uh, was doing a advertisement then with Paul Hadley. He came in to see me on uh, what he might do on the career and so forth, and and he said something that uh, was a sort of a giveaway. He said uh, something about being homosexual at that time, being it's out and teaching. He didn't get into that remotely. And he wanted to go into teaching, who should he see? So I told him what the School of Education was. At that time, it was in the administration building, third floor at the far end. And told him, and then I called the administration, the uh, School of Education people down there on the phone as soon as he left, told him what they were getting in there. And that uh, I said, uh, he told me that he was homosexual. And I said, uh, you people should know that in advance. Otherwise, you had a pleasant conversation. And uh, they, of course, replied to him. He left, and you got no answer. They were not going to accept him. I trained him to be a teacher. They never did tell him why. And the next thing I know, about uh, four or five hours later, a policeman's coming in to see me in my office. They found a note in his pocket about an appointment he had with me at a certain time. And I was the one that sent him to the School of Education, so they weren't on the list. Only me. And I said, to him, something happened. Yeah, he committed suicide. Mm -hmm. He'd uh, gone to a bar down Main Street somewhere, gotten a drink, went in men's room and hung himself. I just didn't see the signal there. I'm not mature enough to see the signal. I don't justify them, not remotely. Uh, I think it's confused biology. But. Uh, I uh, certainly should have handled it differently. Well, that one haunts me even to this day. And uh, there's another one about a young lady that uh, I never could understand. Uh, she'd come in and sit and just weep, just weep, and nothing but weep. I couldn't get a word out of her. And yet she was doing other things pretty well at school. Then she'd come in and start to say something, and she'd start, and silent weeping, not bawling, wiping her eyes, starting to speak, couldn't speak, and just wait and wait. And I talked, meanwhile, tried to get her calm, never did. And finally I thought, well, I can't handle this. I've got to get uh, our professionals on it. So I called the uh, health center where the uh, university staff psychiatrist was, doctor, and told him a bit on the phone in disguised language. And they sent somebody over to escort her over to him. And they brought her parents into the picture, and I, that was it. Everything ended for her, too. You have mistakes like that you make. You didn't, well, I don't know whether that was a mistake or not. You just didn't see signals right. And when you're playing junior god with people's lives, you have to be infallible. We're going to wrap this up. Uh, but if there are any other final comments that you wish to make about USC, or I think they're doing USC. a spectacular job with the Amaritai Center. My highest congratulations to them. When I went over there to help Harriet, she was the only one in the office, and she wanted to have something that happened in the office, she called the time lady. What time is it? Okay, they give you the time. Just to hear a voice, it was dead. Jim Peterson had a great idea about the Ameritai Center, but I uh, thought that they just uh, launch yet. They haven't done anything with it yet. and. Uh, I don't have the energy to do it. I had a major health problem. I couldn't take on a big job like that. Peterson asked if I would, and I told him, no, I'll help, but I can't do it. And so it was organized, and Tone Hall came in, and he was willing to do it. He had just retired himself. So we hit poor Tillman with a job, and I decided to help, and then it was I began to come out of my own problem and brought in uh, Paul Hadley, as my old friend. And Paul really uh, did the big job in putting us uh, in the right direction. He's a very good administrator, one of the best.